the brain is actually described as a cognitive miser. So in other words, it's um, it really has three main roles. It's um, for speed, energy efficiency, and for threat detection. There's a Harvard pro professor by the name of Gerald Zaltman. So, um, you know, he estimates and a lot of people have quoted to that up to, uh, you know, 95% of our daily activities are actually, um, you know, operate below the level of consciousness. Um, but our decision making is highly influenced by our subconscious mind. Hello, Sales Nation. I'm Will Barron, host of the Sales Man Podcast, the world's most downloaded B2B sales show. If you haven't already, make sure to click subscribe. And on today's episode, we have the legend is Felix KO. He is the founder over at happybuyingbrain.com. And that's exactly what we're getting into in this episode. We're getting into the primal brain and how and why you need to target it with your messaging, your selling, your marketing, and your conversations if you're going to get deals done during this current phase, this current time of economic upset and unrest that we're all selling through. Everything that we talk about in this episode is available in the show notes over at salesman.org. And so with that, let's jump right into it. What parts of the brain are involved as a whole in the buying process? And then we'll narrow it down to the primal brain specifically. Yeah, absolutely. So when you look at the the whole brain itself, it's really, um, you know, split up into three parts. So um, there's a there's a model that was introduced by Paul McLean, which is a neuroscientist uh, in the 1960s, and he called it the triune brain. So that's um, so he uses the words tri as in three parts. So that's how he explains the model. So um, the starting at the the base of the model or at the base of the brain right here is that um, you would have the uh, reptilian uh, reptilian brain. So that's more like your physical brain. Uh, that's more um, you know automatic, fast, uh, reflexive. And um, that's uh, definitely involved in the fight or flight response. Mm -hmm. And then if you set ascend upwards from there, you have the midbrain, which deals uh, primarily with emotions and uh, social situations. So those two um, components together uh, would comprise of the primal brain. And then um, so what sits on top of that is um, the all familiar, um, you know, neocortex, which is your logical brain. So when you look at the structures, um, those are the three main parts. But um, to simplify that, you know, you got your reptilian brain, which is at the base or the brainstem. And then when you combine that with your midbrain, um, those two parts are um, what you're considering when you're talking about the, the primal brain. And as a human, I guess we're kind of looking inwards at ourselves. We don't we don't think in three different stages typically or our consciousness doesn't it might be in three different stages, but our consciousness doesn't perceive it as that. So how are these parts of the brain interacting with each other? Does it start at one end and flow to the other, or do they get to negotiate? How does a decision get made? Sure. So there is a lot of back and forth that goes on, but um, a lot of the decision making actually happens at the primal level. And the reason why is because the brain is actually described as a cognitive miser. So in other words, it's um, it really has three main roles. It's um, for speed. Uh, energy efficiency and for threat detection. So the primal brain, so uh, what ends up happening is the logical brain, even though it's a small part of the brain, it consumes a huge amount of energy. And also, um, you know, if every stimuli um, entered the um, uh, logical part of the brain, which is the neocortex, then it would totally shut down. It, it would just be overwhelmed. So it needs to, in a sense that the primal brain acts as a gatekeeper. So um, what it does is when it looks at, um, let's say, a new stimuli entering in, its first task is to assess whether this um, new stimuli is going to increase the survival or the success in terms of the survival or reproductive uh, success of the individual. So, um, you know, for example, like if you come across, um, let's say, a new food source, um, you know, the, the primal brain automatically kicks in and uh, and reevaluates, hey, is, is this something that's going to help, um, you know, with uh, the, our survival, maybe if you meet uh, a potential mate, that's uh, obviously going to add to your chance of reproductive success. And also it looks at a uh, potential threat at the same time. So if you're walking down the street and you happen to see a lion in the middle of the, the city, then it's probably a good time to, uh, to move away from that. So what ends up happening with that is when, so when information actually flows in, it starts, uh, it actually physically enters the uh, primal brain because there's a lot of pre-processing that happens. And um, an example of that is, let's say that you walk outside and, um, you know, you see like a garden hose and then your heart starts to beat really, really fast. So so before, like that's the pre-processing part. But then when you actually step back for half a second and you actually identify that as only, um, you know, this uh, a hose rather than a snake, then, um, you know, that, that uh, delay in terms of the interaction shows you like 
the flow of the information from uh, that travels from the primal brain into the logical brain. So a lot of people, uh, especially you know in the marketing and sales world, um, what we see is a lot of um, marketing messages that are targeted towards the logic, uh, logical part of the brain. And that's actually the last part of the brain that receives the information. So um, just from the example with the hose there, um, you know, that was clearly shows that uh, the people have a visceral reaction first before the information enters the logical brain where they're able to uh, self or to identify that as something that's non-threatening. And it's really not a snake and, and it's just a garden hose. So um, that's important in terms of uh, constructing like the core messaging and the use of visuals in terms of, like marketing materials and convincing, um, you know, your customers to um, to buy from your company versus um, your competitors. So we'll drag it back to messaging and branding in a second, because that's where sure. the, the value of this episode probably lies mm-hmm. for our audience and myself of, of salespeople. But without going too far down into the rabbit hole of free will, of consciousness, of all this side of things, how much of our um, emotions and our automatic responses from the midbrain or reptilian brain is being held back from us by this this filter or this the, as the kind of gatekeeper between our actions and our kind of neocortex and logical side of our brain? How much of the world are we just not seeing each day, and how much of the time, how much time are we spending each day just automatically plodding along and not actually being in as much control as what we think we are? It's actually a huge amount. So there's actually in 2003, there's a Harvard pr- professor by the name of Gerald Zaltman. So, um, you know, he estimates and a lot of people have quoted to that up to, uh, you know, 95% of our daily activities are actually, um, you know, operate below the level of consciousness. Um, but our decision making is highly influenced by our subconscious mind. So in a sense, um, you know, we are working on an automated basis here. So um, that's the, you know, the importance of the, the primal brain in terms of its influence on um, you know, everybody's uh, daily activities and, and also on the consumer's uh, purchasing decisions as well. Uh, again, a slightly off topic question here, but does that scare you, Felix? Because that number makes me feel a little bit awkward and confused to to think that 95% of the things that I'm doing each day, even if it's as low level as brushing my teeth, I'm not actually in control of that at it, when it happens and I'm only consciously in control of it perhaps midway through. Right. Uh, you know, what? like that's the thing with, um, you know, like the neurosciences, neuromarketing, there's always been talks about, um, you know, like how do would you like how do you incorporate the advantages of neuroscience within the boundaries of ethical marketing? And uh, once again, neuromarketing is simply a tool. And with any tool, you could use it for good or you could use it for the other uh, in the other direction. So as long as, you know, like, let's say businesses and, and salespeople, they use it to actually enhance the lives of their consumers and help them, you know, achieve a better version of themselves and provide tons of value in terms of solving their pain points. And I think, you know, that's the the direction that you want to be using uh, neuromarketing. And um, also it's a, it's a complex uh, um, issue with a lot of um, different variables. For example, you have the uh, brands and, um, you know, they want to provide the best services to, or f- best services and products to their consumers. And if, um, you know, they don't use, let's say, the knowledge that uh, that comes from neuromarketing and neurosciences, now are they doing a disservice to the consumers by providing inferior products or maybe eliminating the choice or the, the loss of freedom of choice in terms of um, creating variety of uh, products that their consumers may may want? And from a consumer point of view, you have it from the point of view that they're always looking for the best thing as well. So, um, you know, you have that pairing and then on a marketplace, you know, how do businesses gain uh, a competitive advantage within uh, their industry? So you have all those different variables uh, working together and something like this is a work in progress. So, um, you know, moving forward and uh, as we continue going forward is that it's it's more important to find the common ground between the interests of, let's say, the brands and, you know, the consumers and the marketplace all in relation to, um, you know, issues that involve transparency, privacy, and ethics. But once again, it it uh, it always ties back to, you know, what's the mission of the business? So if that's to if that's their mission to truly help, um, you know, make people's lives better, then, um, you know, near marketing is certainly something that's very powerful to enable um, companies to do that. Cool. All right. So I want to get into how we can leverage this practical ways we can implement mm-hmm. it in a second. But one final layer before we get to that, how much of this is perceived as in it, we see a number on a screen that is a ends in a nine or a seven or a five rather than a whole number, how much of it is 
perceived and then acted on, which clearly that is psychology works with pricing. But if we logically thought about it, we'd we'd know that it's only a dollar, two dollars different. How much of all of this is perceived versus actually has to be real, if that makes sense? Yeah, so that, that makes sense. So here's the thing is that every form of marketing is actually a form of subconscious influencing. Let me give an example, as you mentioned. So priming. So priming is just being exposed to a stimulus, right? So such as a word or an image that uh, will influence how somebody responds to uh, identical or similar uh, stimulus in the future. So once again, um, you know, like with, through all the uh, repetitions or what we call it in your marketing, the mere exposure effect. So the more times that someone sees it, then they're more likely to draw an association with that concept or that brand in terms of solving a particular problem. So even though, um, you know, they would happen to come across that, um, let's say that symbol or something that's symbolic of that brand today, um, you know, something later on like environmental cue would actually trigger it in the future. And um, that's something that would increase the chances of them taking action uh, to make the purchase, for example, or take the call, uh, desired call to, call to action. So I think in terms of uh, perception and, and um, you know, what's real, I think they're not two separate entities. Like you can't really bucket the two. They're more tied into uh, each other because there's a lot of mechanisms that actually, um, you know, cross uh, reference in terms of um, how the entire, you know, kind of ecosystem works. Okay, so how do we start to use this then? So you mentioned uh, priming and you, you mentioned messaging earlier on. For individual salespeople, we can come to marketers and sales leaders and, and leadership in a second, but for individual salespeople, is there anything that they should be doing to implement some of this neuromarketing to get their potential customers to make decisions quicker or to educate them on a dis to better educate them on a decision, perhaps? Sounds good. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So Let's look at the primal brain right now. So the primal brain, the role of it is to ensure the survival and reproductive success of the individual, right? So so um, the primal brain is actually guided by six uh, main primitive instincts. Uh, so that's uh, survival, reproduction, safety, security, sustenance, and status. So there's certain factors that, um, you know, help an uh, individual actually fulfill those uh, primitive instincts. And those could include, um, you know, the emotions that, uh, or the role that emotions play in the decision-making process, um, environmental cues, uh, rewards. Um, and a, a really th strong one is actually the rich uh, neural networks of associations of like thoughts, uh, impressions, ideas, memories that are actually are related to a brand. And all of this actually happens, um, you know, so quick that the conscious mind doesn't become aware of it. And um, what that leads to um, what we call um, cognitive biases, or, which are just logical um, syst or systematic errors in logical thinking and heuristics, uh, which are uh, mental shortcuts in decision making. So, um, you know, with the salesperson, if they know these are the uh, subconscious drivers, which are rooted or hardwired into those six primitive uh, instincts, they could start to now prior prioritize, you know, which ones are the most uh, important ones that I should focus on? So let's say today, um, you know, out of the six, um, three of them would be probably the top, which is survival, security, and safety. Because right now, if you look at status, it's probably not very high up there. Um, you know, reproduction, it could be, but compared to the other ones, it probably doesn't hang, rank as a priority. And sustenance, uh, you know, generally people still have access to uh, food and and stuff like that. So that's probably something that ranks below that. So if you could focus on those three, now you could actually craft your marketing stimuli to actually fulfill those uh, primitive instincts. So right now, because there's a lot of imbalances in terms of, um, you know, security like and, um, and safety and survival, it's um, their emotional state is, um, is really, or the primal brain is really in a hyperactive uh, state right now. So that uh, means that uh, a lot of people are experiencing, you know, high levels of anxiety, um, fear, uh, uh, scarcity as well, um, you know, loss of control. And um, so the way to look at it as a salesperson is that you're a brand and a brand is a verb or an emotional state. So now your job is to come in there, find the proper uh, marketing stimuli in order to bring them or your consumers from that heightened, uh, you know, primal anxious state of mind and bring them back to pretty much uh, a more calmer um, and certain, um, you know, emotional state. So, um, you know, uh, some of the ways that you could do that is what the primal brain is really receptive of is um, in, in terms of the way that I want information presented to it. You know, there's um, seven ways that uh, have been found very effective, which is uh, uh, presenting your information in a novel way, in a visual way, in a safe way, uh, in a simple way, 
fast way, tangible way, and from a high status position. So that's almost like your key, so to speak, to get through to the gatekeeper, if you want to uh, to put it that way. So I'll give you an example. So let's say you're a toy company, or you're, you're, you're like say you're a salesman, or you um, and and you own, let's say your own toy company, but you're one one person um, company. So right now, number one priority, everybody would uh, agree with this, it'd be safety. So, you know, so to present your uh, your toy, for example, one way to be is to include, let's say, um, you know, hand sanitizer so that when mm-hmm. the, um, you know, when your consumers um, receive it, then they don't have to worry about like how many people have touched along the way from the factory to get to your house, for example. So you want to definitely check mark that box off. Um, one of the big things right now is um, is resilience because relationships are getting tested in this new type of environment. So now how do you build your relationship, let's say, with your children? Um, so this is an innovative approach that um, you know toy companies could take by uh, maybe branding their toy as something, maybe like a Lego type of idea where now the mother or father can now use that time to spend with their their kids and 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 play have play time together. So uh, you know, in order to establish that relationship, so um, you know, those are those are some ways in terms of how to fulfill and enhance those primitive instincts in order to restore that balance back in people's lives that that it's uh, you know certainly missing right now. So our audience is a B two B sales audience. So let me give you an example of something that I have in highlights of our conversation so far. Felix mm-hmm. done a terrible job of, and then you can hopefully give us. Oh, you're doing an excellent uh, job. <laughs> you, can, you can give us a few pointers on this uh, particular example. So we have pivoted some of our messaging over at Salesman.org, which is a sales training platform to not just talk about you can increase your chances of reaching high levels of commission, but also. If you can, we, we've got this uh, calculation on on the platform that tells you how good you are at sales, essentially, all broken down uh, with all the uh, marketing goblet group removed from it. So if you can increase that number over time, especially if you're working from home right now and perhaps your market isn't buying, if you can increase that number over time, you can then report that back to your boss and say, hey, look, I'm, I'm still trying, I'm still training. I'm not just sat here on my ass doing nothing at home. And so that is an element of increasing your job security because Clearly, the sales manager is going to, if he has to let two people go from the team, he's going to let the people go who haven't done any work, made no sales and and done nothing over the last three to six weeks, whatever it is. Now, we've done this and tried to communicate this by putting bullet points on a screen. As we're discussing uh, this uh, neuromarketing, Felix, it seems like that's more of a logical way of describing it rather than tapping into the primal side of the brain. So for someone who's perhaps in our position, who's slightly shifting their their marketing messaging or their sales messaging at the moment, how could we better communicate that with our potential customers, the audience, everyone listening right now? How can we better communicate that with them to target the the primal side of the brain? Sure. So right now is um, right now. Are you using visuals or is this? It's this literally bullet just a, a bullet point in a list on the on a, on a few pages and included on the homepage. The primal brain is, um, it doesn't do a good job in terms of processing abstract um, concepts. So words is actually an abstract uh, abstract concept. And that's something that the logical brain does very, very well. The primal brain actually responds uh, primarily to visuals. So once again, like, as we mentioned at the very beginning, um, you know, that's why you want your marketing or your core messaging to um, have a lot of visuals in there, because that's actually one of the, the ways that the um, primal brain responds. And in fact, um, in terms of um, how fast the primal brain could um, process, let's say visuals versus um, uh, words, for example, it's up to sixty thousand times faster. So that's why when you look at it, um, you want it to be as easy as possible for the primal brain to understand what's going on, because throughout evolution, um, we've always been conditioned to understand um, concepts in the world around us in terms of um, visuals. So um, that's why, um, you know, this changing uh, this, the format instead of bullet points into mm-hmm. more um, visuals that are emotionally engaging. And by tangible, um, you probably want to add like a tangible aspect of it, which means to engage the five main senses in the visual. And, um, you know, that way, because the brain at the, the very base of the primal brain, it's a physical brain. So physical as in touch, right? So that's why tangibility uh, matters a lot to it. So, um, you know, pictures that would um, want someone to physically engage with um, with that process would uh, definitely be helpful in terms of, um, you know, influencing the primal brain to take action. 
And how, because this reminds me now of presentations. Most presentations are mm -hmm. crappy bulleted lists and then an occasional big stock image of some woman in a dress running across a field, which means nothing, right? So should we be doing the same thing in our sales presentations uh, as well as just our kind of more formal marketing? Uh, well, that's a good question. What it is, is when generally what ends up happening, if you present too much information, then you go, oh, have something called uh, cognitive over, or, uh, overload. So the the opposite of that is actually called uh, processing fluency. So that's just the degree at which something, uh, you know, a concept is uh, easy to grasp and understand. So, um, you know, with that in mind, when creating presentations, you definitely um, want to keep that probably at the, the as, as a top priority. And um, that way you would keep the attention of the audience because it's very easy for the audience to uh, you know, look somewhere else and everybody has a phone nowadays, so you could check your phone. So, uh, you know, having an, an image and, um, and even um, having a few words because the audience tends to read a lot of the words and they could read a lot faster than, you know, the uh, presenter can speak. And now you're gonna have a disconnect between, um, you know, the information that the presenter wants to share um, versus the slide in terms of how it's conveying the information. And how does this then finally try, because I get I, I kind of going down the, the the funnel here of marketing to a sales presentation, then perhaps mm -hmm. to conversations. Can we use this via language as opposed to being a, a visual or, or more visceral? Can you pull on the same um, uh, uh, like primal primal influencing points by, with your words or are words just totally abstract and uh, 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 missed by this filter altogether? Absolutely. So it does respond to um, anything that it perceives as a threat, for example. So if, um, let's say that you're looking to get more click, uh, click like you want to increase your click-through rates, for example, and um, you want to rank higher, let's say, on your um, you know, search engine results page, um, you know, one of the ways that you could do that in your title and your uh, meta description is use words such as avoid or protect or danger, for example. And those words will trigger, um, you know, like the the primal brain to um, pay more closer attention to those words because now it's actually, um, uh, you know, a potential threat to it, even though it's uh, words on the screen. But that's how the primal brain would perceive it because it doesn't really know what's real or what's not real, right? So but it does understand um, you know, the concept of staying safe. We'll do that for this episode, Felix. The title of this episode will be Danger! Um, exclamation mark, And then the title of the show. The episodes typically get between 30 and 50,000 downloads, but depending on the week and what's going on, the on, on the audio side of things, they're relatively um, similar. There's not too much of a gap between them. So I'll see if that makes a difference, uh, I guess. Yeah, give, give it a try because when we look at it, like, um, you know, the... It's always um, like biohazard, and if you look uh -huh. at all the symbols, um, they're put in a way where it all, it immediately lets the person know that to stay away from this. So it's this um, you know better way to to use language to um, trigger those primal senses. And I guess if we did this every episode, people would realize that logically, then that it, it would be it's it's not um, it's not legitimate. So, is there a risk to using neuromarketing and I guess neuroselling, if that's a if that's a term as well, that we can almost become the boy who cried wolf of constantly bombarding the primal side of the brain, and then it just it becomes numb to us. Well, that's the thing with the uh, with the introduction of novelty. So that's where the the creative side comes into play. So, um, you know, an example of the, uh, um, so the Energizer Bunny. So the Energizer Bunny, which is, um, you know, they're the huge battery company. I think everybody knows them. Um, so Energizer, the, ba the, the battery company. So they've been, that bunny or that uh, pink bunny has been around for 30 years. So they were wanting to keep it still fresh and innovative. So how do you do that when a console has been around for 30 years, right? That's a really, really difficult pro uh thing to do, um, especially when you're, when, um, you know, the, the same, all it does is, is beat to drum uh, in the commercial. So <laughs> yeah. how do you keep people now captivated uh, during that time? So they were, what they're able to do is, um, you know, now they have the saying of, you know, it keeps going and going and going. So during that commercial, what it does is actually, it actually pauses very briefly. And then the bunny actually turns to face the camera and it goes, the you know longer lasting batteries with the help of carrots and that's when the the bunny is actually holding a carrot and is using that to bang on the 
on the uh, the drum. So that was something that was novel and unique. And, uh, you know, like things that are novel, um, you know, surprising and, and um, spark curiosity, it actually, um, you know, triggers the release of dopamine in the brain. And it keeps people, um, it keeps people attention during that time as well. So that's a good example of how you could have this old concept, but still be very innovative in terms of um, creating um, a lot of novel aspects to in order to, um, you know, grab and keep the attention of the audience. What would be an example for an individual salesperson to do that? Because I know the opposite of that is what I get every day, which is, hey, Will, just checking in to see if you know, you're ready to do the deal. That's, there's nothing novel or interesting about that whatsoever. So if that's on one end of the scale, what could be perhaps an example of, even if we have to brainstorm it now, but what would be perhaps an example of a, a real novel way of, of reaching out and communicating with a potential buyer? Well, right now we're, we're kind of in a novel um state of being right now in terms of her like our um you know our health and economic crisis mm -hmm. so i think one of the main transitions going to happen is that as uh you know in marketing and, and sales you're you're seen as like say the trust advisor but now um whenever there's a kind of like a low point here you have people are going to look for more reasons to want to trust you so there's going to have to be a transition from even to trusted advisor to maybe even to like a trusted friend in order to move that process along um, a lot quicker or, um, you know, more efficiently, so to speak. So, um, you know, in that respect, so now you have to show yourself as a friend and, and you have to talk to them as though, like, how would a friend talk to another friend in terms of checking up uh, rather than, um, you know, the, the relationship of how does a, how does, let's say, a salesperson talk to um, their consumer? So it's just a kind of like a shift in thinking kind of seeing things from a different angle simply because of the new um, reality we're living in and how everybody wants to um, be safe and not make decisions where they're going to regret or, you know, feel any sense of shame and so forth. That makes total sense. Well, with that, Felix, we'll wrap up here, mate. Tell us where we can find out more about you and everything that you're up to. Yeah, absolutely. So there's uh, three ways to uh, get in touch with me. The first one is I'm active on LinkedIn. So if you search Felix KO in the search box, I'm uh, more than happy to connect with people on there. Uh, the second way is you could uh, contact me directly through email at uh, felix at happybuyingbrain.com. And then uh, the third way is you could check out my website, uh, happybuyingbrain.com. Um, you know, I have a, a blog there as well. So free free to, uh, to subscribe and um, learn and keep uh, you know up to date on uh, the newest uh, happenings in uh, the near marketing world. And also you get uh, you know send a message through the contact form and uh, be more than happy to uh, to uh, reply to you as well. Great stuff. Well, I'll link to all of that in the show notes to this episode over at salesman.org. And with that, Felix, I want to thank you for your time, your insights on this, which are really fascinating, mate. I appreciate it. And for joining us on the Salesman Podcast. Thank you. Well, this is awesome. Thank you so much. It was a delight to be on here. I appreciate it.